The opening 10 or so hours of Dragon's Dogma 2 feel like a test. A test that will either send you running in the opposite direction, very likely covered in your own tears, or alternatively, a test that will leave you exactly where this review is going. I have put 51 hours into Dragon's Dogma 2 since Capcom were nice enough to send me a code a week ago. And coming from a diehard fan of the first game, was the follow-up worthy of a 12-year wait? Story, exploration, gameplay, bugs, and performance. That's what we're covering in that order, spoiler-free and quickly, so you know what you need to fast. And with that in mind, what you absolutely have to be aware of going in is that Dragon's Dogma 2 does not care about getting you hooked on its main story from the beginning. Instead, the priority is getting you out and exploring, as within 20, maybe 30 minutes of gameplay, you will somehow already be out in this huge open world with a full squad of NPCs that you personally assembled. Dragon's Dogma 2 has the most straightforward, you don't need to have played the first game story setup ever. You're the chosen one, but there's some memory loss involved, so what exactly that means is something of a mystery, so get out there champ and figure out your place in the world. I know, how, ori <laughs> how original, but from there, the main story splinters out in far less generic directions that I advise you stay as in the dark about as possible because it does get very good. Really though, the main quest often just serves as connective tissue, driving you through what this game is truly all about. And that is the exploration and your pawns, which are the NPC companions that follow you around during your exploration. To be honest, it's the side content you'll come across while exploring that makes up the majority of Dragon's Dogma 2. And I am telling you, this is a game where if you just try to plow through the main quest, then you will miss 95% of the best content this game has to offer. The reason I said the first 10 hours or so feel like a test is because the first section of the map, or at least what you're most likely to work through first, is essentially a little trial area that's meant to teach you what the entire game is going to be like. You might watch some of my footage and think, man, that area looks a little empty. And yes, it does appear that way, but really, no. Uh, Dragon's Dogma 2 does exploration in a way that I've not really found anywhere else in the past several years. The magic of a game like, say, Elden Ring is that you'd see something far in the distance, and you could eventually go there, and it would always live up to that first time you spotted it from afar. In Dragon's Dogma 2, yeah, you'll often find vantage points showing you landmarks you've yet to reach, but also, this game is not afraid to hide the greatest content in the most mundane of places. You might think you're booking through yet another generic forest populated by endless goblins because there are a lot of goblins, but really you just ran past a hidden path or skipped over a cave system that held an extensive side quest on par with the quality of the main quest. And even some of the simple loot discovery is so creative in ways that really only Dragon's Dogma does. For example, for a very specific example, uh, you might see a chest on top of some tower you'd have to fly to reach. You can't fly, but that chest is there for a reason, so figure it out. And by figure it out, I mean go in your inventory, place a smoke beacon to lure a harpy, then tackle that harpy and have it fly you over to the tower. Dragon's Dogma 2, just like the first, is filled with moments like that where you'll need to problem solve. And while maybe the game will give you a hint, usually through a comment from one of your pawns, that is all you're getting, just the one hint. You know, recently there's been this big yellow paint debate discussing how 90% of modern single-player games slap ugly yellow paint over everything, so you're always being led directly by the nose and there's no risk of players actually having to think. Dragon's Dogma 2 is the anti-yellow paint game. It's the we hope our players weren't eating too much yellow paint as a child game because you're gonna need your brain for this one and that also applies to some of the combat. Part of creating your character at game start is choosing a vocation or your class. During character creation, there are four starter options, more will come later, and I just went with a fighter to start. To be honest, for the first several hours, at least with my vocation, the combat was very basic and not particularly challenging. And by the way, there are no difficulty options, at least for your first playthrough, so we'll all be having the same experience difficulty-wise. The game starts you out with a very limited move set, just your light and heavy attacks plus a couple of default special moves for your vocation, and you'll learn the ropes fighting goblins, harpies, and wolves for quite some time, plus the occasional early game mini boss here and there. Now that said, the combat at game start is easily its lowest point, it's not even close, because things keep opening up and becoming more and more complex and more refined weirdly, and after 51 hours. I am seeing zero signs of that slowing down with just my one vocation, of which there are ten total, including the starter four. 
You can switch vocations at inns you'll find at certain settlements, though it is worth pointing out your character has both a standard rank, which increases basic stats, and also a vocation rank that's tied to unlocking new vocation-specific abilities. So if you switch, you'll still have your strength, defense, carry weight, etc. stats as they were, but your move set is going back to basics. Overall though, I found the gameplay progression and how your class opens up from very basic beginnings to something far more complex to be extremely satisfying. The combat itself, like when you're in the action, is solid, but I will say that the more unique boss battles, the ones that require teamwork, are easily the highlights, far and away the highlights, because one criticism you are going to hear a lot is that this game is fairly lacking in basic enemy variety. Get used to goblins, wolves, and harpies, because for the first 25-30 hours or so, that is all you'll be seeing. And I'm not exaggerating for effect, that is all you'll be seeing outside of the occasional mini-boss, plus maybe some aggressive slime in a cave. And for the record, the mini-bosses get repeated a lot too, although those never really got old to me, at least not yet. For how genuinely deep the combat system becomes though, I do think the lack of enemy types lets that depth down a bit, because if you're planning on playing this, I guarantee you that there will be times that you'll be all excited to try out a new move you unlock through your vocation, or to put that new sword you bought to the test, only to then go two or three hours without running into anything other than 14 identical packs of goblins. I'm not saying you won't run into any content, but just enemy-wise, it's a lot of grunt patrols. and. That's hardly a problem exclusive to Dragon's Dogma 2, but the combat system here has so much more to it than damn near any other game out there that you really want to unleash both yourself and your pawns on something exciting, but instead you often have to settle for a couple hours of slaughtering goblins before you get anywhere good. And to be honest, killing the grunt enemies does not require any thinking, whereas the bosses do, and you'll get by just fine hacking away at them if that's how you want to play. Speaking of pawns though, well, they're kind of a big deal and deserve their own section, especially because one of them is almost as important as you. At game start, just after you create your own character, you'll be prompted to create a second, that being your main pawn. I made mine a fighter too, probably not the most tactical idea, but I liked the thought of it, and the rest of your four player party is made up of rental pawns. Your main sticks with you from game start to end and levels up alongside you, but the rentals are very different and very disposable. You can find them absolutely anywhere, they wander the open world and can also be hired using a rift, which is essentially a pawn rental center, plus interacting with those rifts also resurrects your main pawn should they die. What's really fun about the rentals though is that, for the most part, they are the primary pawns of other players, so what you're seeing at the rifts are pawns designed by the community, and because of that, your primary pawn can also be hired out. That doesn't mean they'll ever disappear from your squad, but you might wake up after camping and hear them comment about how they went on some adventure without you. I was a tad incautious in my travels this time. A horde of goblins got the better of me, if you can believe it. During combat and exploration especially, the pawn system has quite a bit to it. Combat itself is more about preparation and putting together a squad whose abilities complement each other, something your primary pawn will even comment on if you're doing a good or poor job of, whereas exploration is where the system really shines. Every pawn has various traits, and depending on what they specialize in, they might be able to help with a quest, or you might be traveling through an area and your rental will mention how they'd already been through that area with their master, and they know where treasure can be found. And if you give them the go-ahead using one of the pawn commands on the d-pad, they'll take you right to that treasure. That's not something you can consistently rely upon, but it's neat when it happens. The main drawback to the pawns really just comes back to an echoed complaint from the first game, and that's the fact that they never shut up. Different combinations of materials result in different creations. For every one extremely cool moment, there will be five or more where one of your pawns just says the most useless thing you've ever heard. I mean, right on topic, if you don't have a pawn that specializes in something related to your quest, then get ready to hear your pawn mention every five seconds that you could hire someone else if you need help, and they won't stop repeating that suggestion until you go into the menu and set another quest as your priority, because most of the time you won't need help. The worst pawn quip though comes from picking up items, because after every three or four pieces of loot you pick up, you'll get this same repeated double comment where one of the pawns says, this item is generally used as a material, which is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, no shit this item is used as a material, but the quote isn't over because it's always tied to a second line where one of the other pawns will say, different combinations of items results in different creations, and every time you'll just be thinking, 
Yeah, I could have figured out for myself that if I mixed a grape and a cranberry together, it'd give me a different result than a hunk of copper and a stick. Other than the constant chatter though, the puns are pretty cool, though I've noticed they're prone to throwing themselves off of cliffs from time to time, though who isn't? I also loved how after a battle you'd often high-five your pawns, and if you fell from a great height and one of your party happened to be below you, then they would catch you to stop any damage you would have taken. And more broadly speaking than just the pawns, this game is full to the brim with nice little moments like that. To speak on some of the less nice moments though, I promised to talk about bugs and performance, and one of those two categories is unfortunately where Dragon's Dogma 2 falls seriously short. In the bug department, if I'd been sent a code a little later and had only made it, say, 25 hours in, then I probably would have said Dragon's Dogma 2 was near bug-free in my experience, because I had nothing major go wrong up until that point. Then though, I had a major side quest completely break, I just couldn't talk to the NPC required to end the quest, he only had his shop dialogue available, so I've been stuck with that quest in my log for nearly 30 hours at this point, that's an ongoing situation. And directly after that quest broke, and I mean directly afterwards, I had another side quest break, where the NPC I needed to speak to just disappeared entirely. Although that one did fix itself when I left the area, and then returned to where I'd initially met the NPC, at which point the quest just started all over again like I'd never spoke to him in the first place. After that though, I've then gone another 20 plus hours with no bugs whatsoever, so if it weren't for that one very frustrating session, I'd have no complaints. The same cannot be said for this game's performance, and I want to be crystal clear here. Overall, Dragon's Dogma 2 is a game I'm loving, and I say I'm loving as an ongoing term for two reasons. One, because 50 some hours is not enough to get everything there is to get out of this game, it's just the best I could do since being sent both the code and the review embargo at the same time a week ago, but also because if the PC port ends up being okay, then I'm planning on starting this game over from scratch the day Dragon's Dogma 2 officially comes out. Why do I plan on starting over? Well, I had requested a PC code as my main platform like I usually do, but for whatever reason I ended up with a PS5 code. I was super grateful to get anything, don't get me wrong, but whereas I've always been beyond happy with my PS5 when I've used it, mainly for like three games which all ran perfectly, Dragon's Dogma 2 currently runs very poorly on console, or PlayStation for sure, and I don't think there's any sugarcoating that, I'd recommend being very skeptical of anyone who does. Unlike every other PS5 game I've played, Dragon's Dogma 2 doesn't have any graphic options. There's just the one setting which leaves you with the poorest frame rate of any game I've played this generation. It's not 60 at 4K, which is expected at this point, but it's also not even 30, and to be blunt, I just can't believe we're still having this conversation in 2024. This game runs not at a locked 30, but instead an uncapped 30, meaning the frame rate can swing above or below that number. And what you're going to frequently notice is the below part of that sentence. Anything mildly intense, anything more than just running through a forest fighting goblins, and this game starts chugging. City centers frequently dip into the mid to low 20s, and combat… I mean, I am scared for console players who are planning to lean heavily into magic. As mentioned, both myself and my primary pawn were fighters, so there was very little graphically intense combat going on, but whenever just the one mage I was running in my party used a spell, Dragon's Dogma 2 would magically transform from a PS5 game into a PowerPoint presentation. Okay, maybe it wasn't quite that bad, but frame rates in the low 20s were common, and is that really what we want to endorse? Are we really wanting to go down that road and say that's okay for current gen consoles? A game that's struggling to hit 30 FPS and has zero options to improve that frame rate? For me, the answer is a hard no. Again, I just can't believe this conversation is being had in 2024. and. It's just such a strange feeling, because Dragon's Dogma 2 is a great game with some goofy quirks, which could word for word also be used to describe the first, but performance wise this one is going to take a lot of criticism, and rightfully so in my opinion. Well, that is all for today. If you enjoyed this review, consider leaving a like, as that's how YouTube decides what's worthy, and I will see you in what comes next. I'd really like to do a follow up review on this game sometime next month once I'm completely done with it, so consider subscribing if you'd like to see that, because barring a disastrous PC port, I'm very excited to jump back in. Thanks to the channel's patrons, as always, for their support, and that's all. See ya!